Is adultery a death knell to a marriage? You know what? It may be, but you know what? It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be a death knell. Now, adultery leaves residuals, residuals that you need to deal with. It, it, it leads, leaves broken relationships. It leaves people hurt and wounded and, and wondering whether they can trust again. But there is healing after divorce. And there can be trust again. There can be restoration again. There can be renewal again. There can be a deliverance from those thoughts that torment you over your sin. And this is what we're going to look at today as we get into Psalm 51 and find out how God restores and how God renews. Do you realize that adultery is almost like death? It brings such a pain and it brings such separation and such trauma to a marriage and to a family and even to, to your relationships with other people. And you wonder, will the sun ever shine again? Will there always be a cloud of darkness over me? Will I always be thinking and remembering my failure? Will my mate never forgive me? Will we never stop talking about this? Will anything ever be like it used to be? As David comes to God in Psalm 51 to confess his adultery, to say to God, God, I have sinned, and, and God, I'm asking you to wash me, and I'm asking you to cleanse me. He cries to God for cleansing in accordance with God's love and compassion. And then he confesses his sin in accordance with God's righteousness. And then what he does is he petitions God. He petitions God in accordance with God's power. God's power to cleanse, God's power to renew, God's power to restore, God's power to deliver. And that's what we want to look at today. There can be restoration, there can be renewal, there can be deliverance. If you will believe God, if you will listen to what God says, if you will embrace his word, if you will cling to him as Jeremiah 13, 11 says, as the waistband clings to the waist of a man. If you will wrap yourself around God and around the truths of God, if you will bury your head in his chest and dwell between his shoulders as Benjamin did in the Old Testament, then, precious one, you will be able to say, make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that thou hast broken rejoice. Hide thy face from all my sins and blot out all my iniquities. God, I need joy back in my life. God, I need gladness back in my life. And so he comes to him, having confessed his sin and having realized that God now is, is able to forgive that sin, to cleanse that sin, because it's God's power to do that. Now, in verse 10, he sees that it is God's power to renew him. And so he says in verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. I've become dirty, now make me clean. But also, I need to have you renew a steadfast spirit in me. Why? Because in the face of sin, I was not steadfast. In the face of temptation, I did not stand. I yielded, I gave in. And so God, I don't want to do that again. And God, I know more than any, any other time, I know the weakness of my flesh. I remember a friend of mine who was a, a, a student at a Bible school and, and pastoring uh, churches on the side. And he told me, he said, you know, I used to get so upset with these men when they would say that they had been tempted by another woman or they had stumbled or they had fallen. He says, I thought that would never happen to me. 
And he says, now I find my heart drawn away. I find my heart enticed. And maybe, precious one, that's where you are. You've been enticed. Maybe you haven't sinned yet. And if you haven't, thank God that in his sovereignty, you're listening to this program. But know this, that God alone can create a clean heart in you. And God alone can renew a steadfast spirit within you. That steadfast, another way to put it, is an upright spirit. An upright, you're going to stand upright. You're not going to bend. You're not going to bow. You're not going to compromise. And then he says this, do not cast me away from thy presence and do not take thy Holy Spirit from me. Don't cast me away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, do you know what? This is one part of the prayer that you cannot pray if you are truly a child of God. And it's so glorious to be able to tell you that. And it's so glorious to be able to tell you that because David did not live in our day. He did not live in our age. Let's say my hand represents the cross of Jesus Christ. Okay, you and I are living over here. We're living after the cross. But David lived before the cross. David lived before Messiah came and died for all of our sins. And in those days, before the cross, the Holy Spirit would come and go on people. I always use my handkerchief to represent the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I say to people, you know, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit moves inside of you. He takes up residence inside of you. And so what would happen is, let's say that this is David in priests and, and kings and prophets in the Old Testament before the days of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit would come and rest on them and leave, rest and leave and rest and leave. David knew the beauty and the intimacy of the Holy Spirit resting on him. And he says, oh God, oh God, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. But you see, when you and I believe on Jesus Christ, when we believe on Jesus Christ, when we hear the gospel, the good news of our salvation, then having believed, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 says, having believed, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit comes into our life, wraps himself around us, he seals us, and he's never going to leave us. And he's never going to fake, uh, forsake us. You say, well, what happened when I sinned? Well, if this is the Holy Spirit, he was grieved. He was heartbroken. And he was grieved because he wanted to keep you from sin. And he was saying, here's the power, here's the power. And you said, no, no, I'm going to sin. You made a willful choice. And when you did, you, the Bible says you quenched the Holy Spirit. You just quenched him and you said, no, I'm not going to walk in that power. And so when you quenched him and you sinned, the Holy Spirit was grieved, but the Holy Spirit was still there. So that's one verse you can't pray anymore. All right. So he says, do not cast me away from thy presence. Well, Hebrews 13, verse five and six says, he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you so that you can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So now, when you receive the Holy Spirit, he's never going to leave you. God's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. So you cannot pray, do not cast me away from thy presence, and do not take thy Holy Spirit from me. He says, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Now, David was saved. He was saved because he believed in Messiah. He was saved because he was looking forward to the coming of Messiah. He was saved by faith, just like you and I are saved by faith. Let's say now my body represents a cross. In the Old Testament, they were saved by faith. In the New Testament, they were saved by faith. There's no other way to ever be saved by faith. Abraham was saved by faith. He was saved before the law came. He was saved before he was circumcised. Abraham was saved by faith. We're saved by faith. So what is he saying to me, to, to God? 
He's saying, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Do you know that when you get saved that there's joy and there's peace? I want to take you to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, it's an, it's an awesome, awesome chapter, a wonderful chapter. And he talks about in chapter 4, and remember there's no chapter divisions. So in chapter 4, he talks about Jesus being delivered up because of our transgressions. In other words, he went to the cross for your sins and my sins. All right, he was delivered up for our transgressions and was raised, raised from the dead because of our justification. In other words, and listen carefully, he was raised because God was satisfied with Jesus' payment, his sacrifice for your sins. Your sins were paid for in full. Therefore, Jesus could be raised from the dead. And he was raised so that God could say to you, justified, justified like a judge sitting in a court, bringing down the gavel and saying, justified, declared righteous in God's eyes. Now he says, therefore, chapter 5, verse 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is the joy of salvation, the fact that you're no longer at enmity with God, the fact that now you have peace with God. He says, through whom, through Jesus Christ, we have also obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And this grace in which we stand, it's the perfect tense in the Greek. Now, the perfect tense in the Greek is like a period something that happens at one point in time and then a continuous line. It happened at one point in time and it continues and remains to be true. So once you receive Jesus Christ, you stand in the grace of God. Let's say this table represents the grace of God. Small, small illustration because where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. So just take the breadth of the earth and say that's the grace of God and then add to it the heavens and that. So we stand in the grace of God. We stand here having been justified by faith and we move in the realm of the grace of God. And he goes on to say this. He says, and not only this, but we exalt. We exalt. We are able to have joy. That's what it means in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, hupomanuing, hanging thou in there. And perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint. Now listen carefully. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The Holy Spirit who was given to us. And then he's going to tell you when the Holy Spirit was given to us. It says the Holy Spirit was given to us while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for us. Hardly for, will a righteous man, one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us when we were helpless. You'll find these words, when we were helpless, when we were sinners, when we were ungodly, when we were enemies. So what is David saying in this psalm? David is saying, God, I know because you're God and because you have the power to cleanse me from my sin, you also have the power to renew me to renew me so I have a steadfast spirit, to renew me so that your joy is there. And listen, right now you may be weeping, but just remember the Bible says, weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, how does all that happen? Well, I'll be right back and tell you the next step. 
when God renews this steadfast spirit, when he restores to you the joy of your salvation, the, the joy that you knew before you got into sin, then what happens? Watch the then. I love it. It gives such hope. In verse 12, he says, Restore to me the joy of thy salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then, then I will teach transgressors thy way and sinners will be converted to thee. In other words, you're not through with me, God. You're not through with me because you have cleansed me, because you have renewed me, because you have restored me. You're not finished with me because now I can teach transgressors. I can, I can work and sinners can be converted to you. You know, one of the things uh, about sin, and, and, and this is, of course, no excuse to sin because you can see the pain and you're going to see the trauma. And, and we're going to talk about what does the mate do? What does the wife or the husband do uh, against whom you've committed adultery? What do they do? We're going to talk about that. But one of the things that, that just redeems my sin for me is knowing God then if my sin has been redeemed and I've learned this lesson, then I am able to share with others and say, don't transgress. It's not worth it. Don't do it. I'm telling you, it's going to cost you more than you ever thought you were going to pay. Don't do it. And then you can say to this person that's sinning, stop sinning right now and turn that sinner around to God so that they might. Do you remember when Peter sinned? I mean, when Peter said, God, uh, Jesus, I would never deny you. And, and, and Jesus looked at him and he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded Permission is how the Greek reads. Satan has demanded permission to sift you as sweet. And when thou art converted, when thou art turned around, strengthen the brethren. So just know that there is a turning around. Well, in this portion of the psalm, he cries to God, and what he does is he petitions God in accordance with his power to cleanse, his power to renew, his power to restore, and now his power to deliver. Look at verse 14. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of thy righteousness. Now, what does he mean, blood guiltiness? Well, if we would go back to 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 11, verses 14 to 21, you remember that he was responsible for the death of Uriah. You remember that Bathsheba mourned over her husband's death. And you remember 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 9, or, or maybe you don't remember it, and I want to take you back and at least look at that verse with you. 2 Samuel, I didn't turn back far enough, chapter 12, verse 9, and listen to what Nathan says. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now listen, if we were to go back to the end of Leviticus and you would see the kinsman redeemer, you would see that anyone that takes a person's life is supposed to die. To deliver the land from the pollution and the blood guiltiness because a life is precious in the sight of God because God, man is made in the image of God. And so he's coming to God and he's saying, God, I acknowledge, I acknowledge what I did wrong. And God, I'm asking you right now to deliver me from blood guiltiness, O oh God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of thy righteousness. You know, you may be in prison right now. You may be in prison because you killed a person. And I just want you to know that there's forgiveness for you also. 
Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, Paul said, of whom I am chief. And Paul had people put to death because they were followers of Jesus Christ. So God can deliver you. Now let's look at the next part of that psalm, verses 15 to 17. David realizes he's done the one thing necessary to have forgiveness. There's only one thing, precious one, that will bring you forgiveness, that will bring God back near to you, that will enable you to sing his praises. I love these verses. He says in verse 15, O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare thy praise. And see, after you've sinned like that, you say, how do I ever dare praise God again publicly? How do I ever be able, how am I ever able to stand and, and, and to extol God again or to give a witness or a testimony when I've done what's wrong. And this is what he says, for thou does not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. In other words, it's not penance. It's not penance. If it were sacrifice, if it were penance, if it were paying for it, I would do it. He says, thou art not pleased with burnt offerings. You say, but they brought sacrifices and they brought burnt offerings. Yes, but those sacrifices and burnt offerings were symbolic. They were a picture to show them what their sin cost them and, and how they could be redeemed. It was the heart that was behind the offering that was so necessary. So he says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, oh God, thou will not despise. That's what you need to realize when you've committed adultery, when, when you have sinned against God in any way and that sin is so grievous to you. There's only one thing that God requires, only one thing, precious one. And if you have that one thing, then God has met with you and you are taken care of. What is it? It is a broken and a contrite heart. A broken heart, the word broken is shabah, and it means to break, to break in pieces. It means to smash to smithereens. And he says, that's my heart. That's my heart because of my sin. It is broken. It is smashed into a thousand little pieces. And you see that. You see my brokenness, and you won't despise it. Not only is it broken, God, but it is contrite. Now, the word for contrite is D-A-K-A-H, and it means one who is physically and emotionally crushed. One who is physically and emotionally crushed because of sin or because of an enemy. That's all God requires. He says, and let me read it to you again, the sacrifices of God. What does God want from you? Just one thing, a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. You've been smashed to smithereens. Your heart is that broken because of your sin. You have been crushed physically and emotionally because of your sin. And God sees that. And God does not despise it. Now, what does it mean, despise? It means to disesteem. It means to accord little worth to something. It means to undervalue. It means to show contempt. And what God is saying is when I see a broken and a contrite heart, I will not disvalue that. I will not look on that with contempt. I will not put it down. Rather, I will accept it because this is what is pleasing to me. And what's the last thing in this psalm? Well, the last thing that you see is David pleads for the welfare of the nation. By thy favor, do good to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem. Why is he saying that? He's saying that because, listen, beloved, adultery pollutes the land. And if we had time, we would go to Ezekiel chapter 33. And there in Ezekiel 33, you will see 
that God is having to judge the land because of all the abominations of the people because of their adultery. David knows that his sin has gone farther than just his personal life. It's affected the nation, and you need to know that. And you need to know that when you come to God with a broken and a contrite heart, God does not despise it, and God will heal even the land.